Well, hello, fellow audio enthusiast. Welcome and greetings to Two Channel Listening. This is version 2.0, my first official video in the new space, in the new place. It's been a minute since we've shared some screen time together, and boy howdy am I looking forward to getting back into a rhythm and providing you wonderful reviews on an every other week basis. If you are new to this channel and this is your first time tuning in, this is round three of the Tecton and Zoo Wars. You should stop this video immediately and go back to the first round with the Zoo Omen ones, the first gen ones with the Tecton Lore base model also original ones. Then you can move on to these dirty weekends, Mark II versus the Tecton Lores in their base form. It has been many months since we've uh, discussed these particular speakers. And since then I have added the Clarity M caps as well as the Zoo feet, the factory rubber feet and Pretty much that puts me all in on these secondhand speakers at $1,080. These elusive creatures, these rare, seldom seen in the wild, Tecton Aroos. I bought these, or I should say I ordered these in February 22nd, earlier this year. Unfortunately, not one, not two, not three, but four months later, I still don't have my grills. So all in with grills, these actually come in at $1,625 as configured, shipped brand new. Now I did reach out to Tammy and Eric recently to hopefully get those grills before this video. And they told me that they are now 12 weeks backlog on all regular speaker orders and have no intentions whatsoever of building any grills in the foreseeable future with the scarcity of wood. You know, on a customer service side, you probably should send some emails out to your customers, especially repeat buyers that you're not going to provide them something they paid for in advance proactively instead of us constantly emailing you, you might save yourself some time and a little bit of angst. We love you guys, but you're not very good at the communication side of your business. Same with the zoo. I've had so many emails from so many followers and so many viewers that have backlog orders and nobody's getting communicated with. On a side note, fellas, gals, this is the new world of supply chain chaos. The prices are going up, the raw materials are getting more scarce, and the backlogs are getting longer. So we all need to have a little bit of patience with our favorite manufacturers but it sure would be nice if our favorite manufacturers were a little bit more forthcoming in their communication. Just saying. So let's get into it, shall we? I picked these Aroos for so many of the obvious reasons. When you go to the Tecton Design website and you look through their 30 different models that they have to choose on their floor standing speakers, this is the only one that has a ribbon tweeter. And this speaker has the same exact outer shell dimensions as the lores. So having done the two different lore comparisons with the zoos, and they both have the venerable B102 Eminence Pro Audio Driver, it was just a natural selection for me to step up to what I would say is the top echelon of the lower line, even though this is called an Aruz. 
The other interesting thing with those 30 different models in the Tecton line is the fact that none of them have the option to select this Fountech Neo 3.0 ribbon driver. That's very curious. I wish I could get more information from Eric on that. Uh, right now, it just wasn't forthcoming on the selection why only one model has this particular drive as an option, driver as an option. So the cabinet, it is the lower cabinet. It is 39 inches tall. It is 13 inches deep and it is 12 inches across. The contender, or I should say the defending champion is the Tecton, the Zoo Dirty Weekend Mark II and its form factor is 12 wide, 12 deep, and 36 high. A little bit less cubic volume for the same, basically the same 10 inch driver. For you boneheads out there who hate anything that has the China label on it, there's been a couple of, uh, let's say, disappointed folks out there that this American speaker has a Chinese Fountech driver in it. These $90 tweeters, it is, uh, I'm not new to them. I actually have the 1.0 version in my Alta Audio IOs, and those are $3,000 bookshelf speakers, and they have the 1.0 Neos in them. I have zero complaints now with both versions of this Neo driver. It is a very smooth sounding tweeter. It's actually more flexible on paper specs than the RAL drivers. If you look them up, this particular 3.0 can play down to 1.4K and is good for 40K. However, its own specification sheet says to stay in its, um, its optimal range, you wanna do a third order crossover and keep it at, two, at uh, above 2.3K. Eric configures this as a 5K handoff. So the B102 does everything below 5K and then hands it off to the Fountech driver. Now, even though it says 3.0, that is not representative of the height or the opening of the driver. It is 2.5 inches high, or I, say, I should say the opening is 2.5 inches by one inch um, gap. The way that it operates, it actually has a pretty wide sound dispersion. Some folks say that they can easily hear the beaming of the narrow, narrower ribbon drivers. There is some truth to that on some of the raw drivers that are only uh, three quarters of an inch to some of them are only a half of an inch wide at, the, uh, at its opening aperture. Not so much an issue with these drivers. Again, they're wide open. They have a very good dispersion pattern and Eric did a, Eric did a very good job of integrating it with the B102. The other unique thing to this cabinet before moving on to the frequencies and its sound signatures, it's interesting, and I don't know if that's because this is the next generation of these cabinets, but unlike the base model lures, there's actually two layers or two um, levels of bracing. I had a hell of a time getting the B102 out of this cabinet, not knowing that there's actual rear bracing behind it that, that is established right up to the magnet. And then there is a liberal amount of that black sticky bitumen applied to it so that the driver, it seats in there and pretty much mushrooms into that, that very tacky material up against this back brace, giving everything a lot more uh, solid feel and helping with the damping responsibilities of the driver. So as a non-scientific test of audibility of cabinet ring, no bracing. 
So you can tell you have a completely open cavity here and the cabinet has quite a bit of ring on the zoo. And with the two different braces, uh, this cabinet actually now has a little bit more inertness, more so than the base model lore. Upon opening this and showing the pictures of the interior for you guys and the, the uh, faux cotton batting that's in, on the inside, the crossover, unlike the lore that sits on that bottom brace in the other speakers, it's actually inverted and mounted upside down to the top brace. And so the two pictures that I show you has the two sand caps, has the two air coils, and has the two Mundorfs which was the upgrade for this uh, particular speaker. I did ask for the upgrade and it gives you the Cardist copper binding posts on the back, lovely binding posts, as well as the two Mon the Mundorf caps versus the regular caps. On this side, 5K. So you have quite a bit of difference on the responsibilities of what this driver has to do. I did some tone testing. I tested at 4K and I tested at 5K. It is incredible how clean this paper driver can still put out as a 5K test tone. I completely covered up the Fountech drivers and it was still so very sharp and so very clean through the, the paper driver of these eminents. Interestingly enough, as a pro audio driver, these were originally built for bass guitar amplifiers. So it is no surprise that as I speak to the other types of music genre and some of my favorite rock, these are rock out speakers. These drivers, they excel at everything electric and acoustic guitar. And naturally, because of the way that they are built, that should be their specialty. Doing other tone tests and sweeps. This speaker is definitely good for audibility down to 32 hertz. I would say that in my listening position, and you perverts ignore this, I have a nine by nine triangle, so nine feet across by nine feet to my ears in my listening position, and the ceilings are 11 feet high. The audibility of the 32 hertz is just ever so rolled off, even going down to 28 hertz. There is a, a very fair amount of room energy, the flexing of the, of the drivers themselves, and the uh, shaking of the floor is still very well felt, pretty well controlled. I would say that there is only a minor amount of port chuffing at the 28 and 30 hertz frequencies. These are flat frequency tests. And so there's not much tone there. And that allows me to be able to hear just the littlest bit of port chuffing. And under normal playback, anything above 95 dB, you're not gonna hear the port chuffing whatsoever through regular you know, uh, music genres. I took Eric to task in the other two videos from a fit and finish perspective. There was no doubt that my hat always goes off to how Zoo finishes their speakers, how they have finishing touches. They go out of the way to add some bling to the speakers and give them a more of a refined feel to them, including the, the maple cabinets themselves. So this is the Sangria Maple. And if you wanted an actual pure gloss finish paint, you're talking about $1,200. This is the charcoal gray and, the, and basically just the flat paint. And there is no bling that you can add. I will say that on a couple of occasions, I've reached out to Zoo trying to order the rings that do fit on the Tecton speakers. These are $90 by themselves. And Tech, or I'm sorry, Zoo said, or Sean, not Sean, Garrett said that they are also backed up on the supply chain. And so they are not able to sell any rings to the public at this time. 
Last thing about fit and finish and another kudos to Eric as I did take him to task on the way that he screwed his speakers together, at least those first generation lures where he used the very cheesy one and a half inch, very basic off the shelf screws from Ace Hardware. These speakers now have legitimate two inch wood screws used to uh, affix the drivers. And there is a very nice crunch, as I mentioned, when piecing the zoos back together with the high quality wood screws that they use, there is a very healthy crunch so that you know that the main drivers are totally affixed to the cabinet and there would be no chance for any kind of air leakage out the sides. As for playback and the source and front end kits that I used during the last five weeks of breaking in the Tectons, I have used my Peachtree Nova 150, the Unison Research Unico P, I now have a newer acquisition that I showed on Instagram. I now have the parallel single-ended integrated amplifier. It's a class A 12 watts all tube stage amp from Eric S Concept from Poland. And then there is that brick shithouse, awesome vintage 1981 Kenwood KR 7050 receiver that was originally my dad's that I've kept in awesome condition. I plug those into these two speakers and you know, regardless of preference, both speakers do really well with vintage receivers. They just have that natural warmth and that ability to use the loudness and boost that bass. If that's, if you're a bass head, you hit that loudness on any of those receivers, those vintage receivers, and these things will blare at you. Um, not my preference. I like to have a, a good natural neutral presentation, but uh, you have the ability to get some extra bass out of these with those vintage receivers. It is, uh, it's quite interesting. So nevertheless, the sound signatures, the, my impression of the Tecton Ruse and my number one key takeaway is the uh, the sound field, the sound separation, and how well it defines small details in almost a 180 degree sound field. I spent a, a fair amount of time playing over and over the, the Melody Gardot Live in Europe album, as well as Sarah Bareilles, her Live at the Variety in Atlanta. There is... I don't want to say this isn't this is new, but I would say it's been a long time for me since I have felt this immersiveness in the live recording. Now I've been to several live shows, several concerts in my time, and the the, the interaction with the singers, with their bandmates, and particularly with their with the fans you hear certain things and you remember, you know, you have this audible memory of how those interactions are, the ambient sounds, people moving around, their clapping of their hands, just the texture of it all. And I have to say, part of it's probably also the bigger room that I have, but more specifically with the Tectona Ruse, there was this palpability and this realism to how I felt like I was sitting in row eight with the Live in Europe Melody Gardot album. Playing Warefaring Soldier on Melody Gardot's bonus tracks, the, again, the, the aural sound field of the, of the fans and listening to them and how they clap. I felt like I was a part of the live recording, or at least more so than I have in a very long time. Through many systems, through many configurations, with particularly with the Unison Research Unico P and, and the, uh, the parallel single-ended in, um, tube integrated, 
those two amplifiers in themselves brought out the, the, the best signature of the Tectona Ruse and just the, the realism and how you hear clapping live versus a lot of different albums has to do with the way that they're mixed, obviously, uh, the way that they're edited in the recording studio. I've heard that album th probably at this point thousands of times. And in a very long time, I haven't felt like I had such a wonderfully immersive uh, feeling as I have lately with those albums and the Tectona Ruse. Moving over to, to the Live at the Variety with Sarah Bareilles, when you play uh, Let It Rain, she interacts with her audience and they obviously, they know on cue to start doing the clapping and the flicking of their fingers to obviously simulate the rain sounds. And again, there's just this, there's this goosebump, joyous feeling of that 180 plane where you, you feel like you're in row three. I feel personally felt like I was in row three, so close to Sarah, yet amongst her, amongst her fans and listening to them snapping and clapping. It just, it had more, it had more dynamic feel to it that is more akin to what you would hear in a live recording. And so I really appreciated that extra detail retrieval that the Tectona Ruse has given me versus most of the last speakers I've reviewed over the last seven months. Uh, moving on to something a lot more heavy. Good old Iron Maiden, and I'm talking about Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. When it moves into the middle passage and you, you feel like you are in the hull of that ship, turning, turning the speakers up and really letting it play, you hear the waves pushing on the sides of the ship as it's, as it's simulating the creaking of the boards. You hear the floorboards. And then there's the, the swinging doors that you can palpably hear them on their rusted hinges as they move back and forth. And without the foul smells of being on the ship, with the lights out, you just have this awesome sense of the details that they added to that song. And again, it just gives you these goosebumps and there's a reason why I love that song so much for doing that and adding that to the context of the song. It just, it, it gets to me and through the Tecton or Ruse, I also realized that these would be excellent left-right speakers in a home theater setup due to the, the sound retrieval, the details there that it did with the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. So for, for those of you out there who are looking for new front-end speakers in a home theater, these, uh, these speakers would probably be very excellent choices on the home theater front as well to have dual purpose. And that brings me to one of my other key words that I wish to use to describe the Tecton or Ruse during my, my last five weeks of them. Absolutely versatile. Absolutely versatile speakers with each of the four different amplifiers and the three different DACs that I used, more so than the Zoo, I was able to hear those subtle differences and those not so subtle differences. Going from obviously the Kenwood to the all two uh, parallel single lead amp I have, that was night and day. Going from the Unison Research to the Nova 150, much more closely voiced and very hard to pick which was my favorite between the two. And when you put them up against the Tecton, when you put them up against the Zoo Dirty Weekends, the Zoo Dirty Weekends, they have a forceful nature to them. They, while they do reflect some nature of the sound signature of your front end, your sources and your amplifiers, not as much as the tectons. 
These are very aggressive speakers and they have a very consistent sound signature that is much more forward in your face and aggressive. And it has a, a grip on each track in a, its own particular way and it doesn't like to let go of that. So with the Zoo, or God, with the Tecton Ruse, just a lot more versatile in letting you hear the differences of your front end gear or your sources. Speaking of that, when you throw on, say, Lord, and you're listening to Royals, the, the sound of the bass, the bass notes themselves, they tend to be a little bit more fleshed out as well with the Aruz. So it reminds me of the, the gushing that I did recently over the Dolly Rubicon 2s. The Dollies with their wood pulp cones, they imparted a particular tonality on bass notes that I had heard in no other speaker that I absolutely fell in love with. There was just certain instruments had more of that, that realism of what a bass note sounds like through a particular guitar or through a particular uh, bass drum or through, you know, snares, whatever the, whichever drum you, you wish to choose, there was a, a sound signature that was specific to the dollies that I actually heard a little bit of through the tectons versus the zoos. There's just a little bit more fleshing out of the inner detail on drum beats and drum, you know, I'm gonna say thwacks, that you got a more, I hate to say faster, there's just, there was a little bit more snappier detail. Minimum at best, but it was there and I could hear it. And it was definitely an improvement in something I would say would be attributed to the, the eminence not having to go the full 10K like in the zoos. These drivers have to work very hard. The tweeters are hardly working at all because they only handle anything above 10K. This particular tweeter is a very smooth tweeter. And so the two worked very well in conjunction with one another. You throw on something like Pearl Jam, Yellow Leadbetter, and Mr. McCready, he is channeling Stevie Ray Vaughan. And again, with both speakers, mind you, they excel at electric guitar. But again, there's just a little bit richer tone, a little bit richer texture with the tectons and a little bit wider sound stage that I really appreciated. That's probably one of my favorite Pearl Jam uh, songs is the Yellow Lead Better. It just, it has this, this Stevie Ray, this Jimi Hendrix vibe to it that harkens back to that vintage tonality and the slow playing of the electric guitar. I love it, and this speaker also excels with that particular genre of music. I don't go too much into the classical, and I'm not, I'm not going to even sit there and harp on the jazz side of things. As much as I love Melody Gardot and her live album, no question, both speakers handle, handle with aplomb. I will say that on a level playing field, the mid-range to mid-range, Obviously, the two drivers are, are related to each other. Yes, the zoo's modified, but I could, not, I could not give a thumbs up or a thumbs down to either one excelling in the mid-range voicing. Uh, both speakers acquit themselves exceptionally well, both very wide open. Again, the zoo just has that more aggressive nature. It's a little bit more forward. The tecton is a slightly more refined but neither will give up one to the other in the mid-range. Once there's the handoff, there is a particular refinement and clarity that comes with the treble energy from the tecton or ruse. And so again, if it's gonna be bottom and it's gonna to be top, the edge definitely goes to the ruse. And it's again, the versatility and the refinement of this particular speaker. I had mentioned this was, as you could probably know this is coming, but I mentioned in my YouTube post 
earlier this week that there's going to be some hardcore fans out there that are going to need to bring out their Kleenex at this given time. Um, you know, it, it, the, for me, there was actually a pretty clear winner. And that is the fact that at $1,550 versus now advertised as $1,979, if you were to buy this today, not only is there no $400 advantage other than the aesthetic appeal of the cabinet, but I really have to say I am, I am ecstatic that I did, I did wait and I did decide to purchase the Aruz and they were well worth the wait. Their versatile nature in playing all the different genres that I like best, all of my favorite music, just the, the, the naturalness of them and how well the two, the two drivers work in tandem. I'm quite surprised that that found tech is not, is not found in more speakers today. At $90 a piece, it is a very good driver regardless of its origin of where it's made. And I have to say that there are times where I think it outshines the RAL driver as well. And the RAL is a good driver, but there's, a, there's just a, a smoothness with this Foundtech that is very impressive. So, you know, from that perspective, it gives me, it gives me an extra sense of owner satisfaction when I do end up having to buy something brand new. And I'm reminded that even though the fit and finish is still has a, a ways to go, the, the money that you are getting out of this is totally in the performance. If you have not heard these speakers and you sit there and dog on them because they have a DIY look to them, you know, shame on you that you criticize something you haven't listened to. And yes, they don't have the WAF factor, the wife approval factor, but you know what? Amanda likes listening to what she heard on these speakers as well. Yes, she would prefer to see these stay. They are not going to stay. I need the funds to continue this channel forward and to bring in other products. And so therefore, the zoos will be dethroned. The crown will be lifted, hoisted, and set upon the Aruz. These will be the new speakers to knock off. If any of you would like further details on the particular amp pairings or the DAC pairings that I use for these comparisons, feel free to reach out to me, send me an email. If you want to know again a little bit more about what my favorite combinations were, the sources were my Yamaha CD2100 uh, used as a DAC. I have the, I'm now breaking in a second hand I bought on Audiogon, the Matrix Element I. That review will actually be coming next. Uh, I have some very strong opinions on that particular unit that runs counter to so much of the gushing that I've seen on YouTube. Many of you will probably be surprised to finally see somebody who was very disappointed in that particular product line. Uh, and it, mainly from a functionality standpoint, I pulled my hair out many, many a time. And then there is using the DAC stage within the Nova F, F-150, within the Nova 150. And that has the Sabre 9018 KT, K2M uh, chip in that. So I was able to use that as well as a source. Um, yes. So feel free to write me if you want more details. The next review will be on the Matrix Element I streaming DAC. The room itself has a little bit more that I need to do to tame down the uh, bit of echo with the high ceilings. I'm adding a little bit of more curtains behind me, but so far I'm pretty happy with the symmetry and it's all, it's all coming together quite well. So thank you so much for your support and we'll be seeing more of each other very soon.